Okay, thank you, Richard. And good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you're here for our study of Ephesians. And this will be the last study this spring on the book of Ephesians. So I want to say a special word of thanks. First of all, to all of you who have been faithful to come and sit in the sanctuary, you know you have a star in your crown. When, when you come and do this, I better turn, turn my silence my phone. And then for all of you that are watching on YouTube, and I know we have a good number who are faithful to do that, and thank you, but that would not be possible without our tech crew. And so Trish and Richard and Tommy, who have been so faithful to be up there every week and to make sure that this is broadcast, I'm very, very grateful. What I'm planning to do tonight, because obviously we're not going to do the whole book of Ephesians, but I want us to look at the 6th chapter, verses 10 through 20, because this is a summary in a lot of ways on what Paul has been talking about. And so that's where we're going to focus our final session, beginning with the 10th verse of the 6th chapter of Ephesians. So let us open with a word of prayer. Dear God, as we gather this evening and as we open your word once again, we pray for insight and wisdom and understanding because we believe that these words are living words. They didn't die 2,000 years ago. They continue to speak to us today. And so we pray that you would open our hearts and minds and ears so that we could hear the word and allow it to make a difference in our life each and every day. Thank you for the faithfulness of all who have been involved in this study. And we pray that you would surround us with your spirit this evening. Amen. So what I want us to do is kind of do a real quick summary of the letter to the Ephesians, which is not a very long letter. There are six chapters. Ephesians opens the very first chapter, which if you could read it in the Greek is essentially two sentences. It's one of the most powerful theological doxologies of praise ever written. I mean, Paul has ascended to the mountain peak of inspiration. And in, in these two magnificent sentences, he has basically explained salvation history. I mean, he, he begins with the foundation of the world, and he goes all the way to the glorious coronation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the first chapter. His words are almost transcendent. They're so powerful. There is a deafening crescendo of theological majesty and glory. And as Paul brings this to a close, in his second sentence, that still boggles my mind that he did all of this in two sentences. He comes to the conclusion when he talks about Christ who was raised from the dead, who now God has sitting at the right hand of the Father. This is now in verse 21. Now look at this. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He has put all things under his feet. He's made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I bet Paul was worn out after he wrote that. It is just absolutely amazing. The Germans have a word for what we would translate salvation history. I have to be careful with this word. Halgeschichte. Halgeschichte. Salvation history. But this is not just salvation history, this is salvation future. Because he's not 
just talking about what has been about the history of salvation, but he's talking about the plan of God. Look at the 10th verse of the first chapter. That God has a plan in Christ for the fullness of time. His plan is to unite all things in him, all things in heaven, and all things on earth. So after this amazing theological doxology, in the second chapter, he becomes more personal and direct. And he begins by saying, you who were dead, he made alive. You, you were dead through the trespasses of your sin, but now you've been made alive. But then there's this passage in, in verse 6, we're in chapter 2 now. He said, and he raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places. Anytime you, you study something, I mean, I've studied Ephesians a lot, but I think this has really jumped out at me this time. In the first chapter, Paul is talking about the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. We're about to celebrate Easter. Raised Jesus from the dead. Our whole faith rests on that foundation. And made him to sit in the heavenly places. Now the second chapter says that Jesus raised us from the dead. Dead of our trespasses. And he has made us to sit with him in the heavenly places. I've just been thinking about that a lot. What does it mean to be lifted up to the heavenly places? We talked about this either two weeks ago or three weeks ago. But I found something the other day. And I want to share it with you. I have been, I've, I've been finishing one of the best presidential biographies I've ever read. John Meacham's And Let There Be Light, the biography of Abraham Lincoln. Ashley, have you read that? I'll tell you, it, it's really, really good. I mean, John Meacham is one of the best presidential historians and a, such a gifted writer, but his research in this was meticulous. It was just amazing. I would highly recommend this book, John Meacham and Let There Be Light. And as the book is coming to a close, he's talking about the second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. You know, th there was a time it didn't even look like Lincoln was going to win the election for a second term because George McClellan, you know, who had been the general, um, his main general for a while, was running against him. And if McClellan had won, uh, the United States would have been a different nation, probably a divided nation. But Lincoln won, and, it t and, and John Meacham, remember, Ashley, how he went into so much detail about his second inaugural address, he said Abraham Lincoln was more of a preacher. He talks about the spiritual dimension of that. But there was something that happened. Apparently the weather in Washington was just terrible leading up to it. Now that was back when the inaugurations took place in March, not in January. But they said when Abraham Lincoln stood up to speak, to deliver his address, the sun came out about the minute he stood up. And then he tells what happened the next day. And I read this and I just went, oh my. So this is the day after the inauguration, which was a Sunday. Said the Lincolns went to the Capitol where there was a church service in the House of Representatives. The Methodist Bishop Matthew Simpson of Philadelphia, a 
devoted union man was scheduled to preach. Simpson, in his diary, just noted, I lost, I'm, I'm on my Kindle, I lost my place. Uh, yeah, he noted in his diary, preached in Capitol House of Representatives, the text, if I be lifted up. He said the morning was pleasant and cheerful. The people who gathered for this included the president, the first lady, the chief justice, the speaker of the house, the secretary of state, William Seward, the secretary of war, Edwin Stanton, and, and many, many others. The president, Abraham Lincoln, entered the chamber bearing what he often did, a walking stick. And he took his seat in front of the speaker's rostrum. Music was played. And then Bishop Simpson began to preach. It said his was a message of unity, of mercy, and of love. A good preacher, he knew how to connect the particular with the universal. The day before, during the inauguration... The sun had come out, brightening the moment that Lincoln rose to address the nation. And the bishop recalled that detail in his sermon. He spoke of the power of Christ to diminish war and promote peace. His sermon was on the fact that only Christ can bring unity which is exactly what Paul is saying in the second chapter of Ephesians. One observer said, I'm not much of a believer in signs and omens, but when yesterday, just as the old administration expired and the new one began, the rifted clouds let God's sunshine flow. And I could not but regard it as a foreshadowing of returning peace, that the war would soon be over. This was March. We know the war was over in a few weeks. We also know in less or a little over a month, Abraham Lincoln would be assassinated. And I want you to listen to this. This is what really got my attention. The mention of peace startled the crowd, which was so accustomed to war. Instantly, as if by electricity, the audience was stirred, an observer recalled. They cheered earnestly. Many rose to their feet. Hats were thrown up. Men embraced each other and wept and shouted. Seated in his chair, absorbing the words and the moment, the President of the United States began to wrap his walking stick on the floor of the House chamber. So much had happened. So much he knew was still to come. On this Sunday morning, in the heart of an embattled and frail democracy, Abraham Lincoln was briefly overcome and he wept. That's being lifted up. That's looking at life from a different perspective. So this, this letter is a theological letter. Until we get midway through the fourth chapter, and about midway through the fourth chapter, and it's around verse 17, Paul changes gears. No longer is it theology, but now it's translating theology into practical living. You know, he likes to use the word therefore. So after all of this, this is how we should live. And by the way, we had looked at the beginning of the fourth chapter when Paul said, therefore, 
You, I beg you to lead a life that is worthy of your calling, worthy of all the theology. So he goes on. He talks about the way that we should act. He talks about being angry but sin not. It's here that we have the wonderful verse, be ye kind one to another. He's telling us how to live. But then we get into the fifth chapter. And in the fifth chapter, he starts talking about husbands and wives and how they should relate to each other. And this is where he says that the husband is the head of the wife. Okay? But that's not all he said. If you look at the 21st verse, we're, we're really moving fast in chapter 5. He begins by saying, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. He does say the husband is the head of the wife as, but that's not all he said. The husband's the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. Now, how is Christ head of the church? He's head of the church by giving himself for the church, by sacrificing for the church. And I don't know anyone, any wife, that would not want to have a husband who would love her so much that he's willing to even give his life for her. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about a mutual submission. It's talking about sacrifice and, you know, what you do for each other. So he does all the practical things, but now I want us to get to the sixth chapter to begin in the tenth verse. The tenth verse of the sixth chapter begins with a word that many people never hear in a sermon. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Be strong in the Lord. Now that is powerful. We should be strong in the Lord. But the statement can really be misleading because when I hear, this is what I hear, be strong in the Lord. I'm supposed to be strong. I'm supposed to be courageous. You, you remember the words in Joshua be strong and of good courage. You know, you need to stand up. You need to withstand all of the evil and all of the bad things. You need to find your inner strength and be strong. But that's not what he is saying. The word, the Greek word here can actually be translated as passive. It's not telling us we have to be strong. It's telling us we must be strengthened. We must allow God to strengthen us because if we read the whole phrase, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his power. This is something that belongs to us. But we have to accept it. We have to receive it. One of the things that I think is difficult for us to identify with, not only in Ephesians but almost any of the New Testament letters, the recipients of this letter were very much in the minority. Today, if you are a member of a Christian church, it's... Well, it used to be you were in the majority. I don't know that that's the case anymore. But at least to be a part of a church, especially in a town like ours, is something that is admired, is respected, and it's something good people ought to do. So it's a good thing. But that wasn't the case in Paul's day. It's hard for us to identify, but think of I, I, the last few days, there's been all this in the news about Russia and the election and everything that's going on in Russia. But then you often hear about the, these dissenters 
the dissenting groups. Think about groups like that. And we all know what happens in Russia when you dissent. It's not good. It's not good at all. But think about that. That's the kind of world that these Christians were in. They were very much in the minority. God's grace had enemies. God's justice had a bounty on its head. And God's peace was undermined by those who were seeking power and control. So we, it's not calling on us to find our strength, but it's saying, look at the, the next, well, let's see which verse it is. It, yeah, the next verse, verse 11. It said, put on the whole armor of God. If you look in Colossians, no, Galatians, the third chapter, Romans, the 13th chapter, Paul uses this phrase that we're to clothe ourselves with Christ. We're to put on Christ. Same word that's used here. It's like putting on a garment, putting on a coat, a cloak. But what he's saying here is we must put on the whole armor of God. And the imagery and the things we're going to see, he talks about the belt, he talks about the, the breastplate, he talks about the, the shield, he talks about the sword. All of those things were common sights for the people in Ephesus because Roman soldiers were everywhere. And he's describing the typical armor of a Roman soldier. But he's telling us, like a Roman soldier might have to do battle with a group or a person. He's saying our battle is not with other people. It's not with flesh and blood. But it's something much greater that goes back to the first chapter when Paul talks about the cosmic reign of Christ. And he talks about God's plan to unite everything in him, in heaven and on earth. Paul's saying, we are contending against the powers and principalities of darkness, against the evil one, against Satan and his army. And then he, he uses this imagery of a soldier who has on the armor. But in an interesting twist... He reinvents the image so that the common parts of the armor, the belt, the breastplate, the shield, and all of that become truth and righteousness and faith. So the armor, usually a symbol of self-reliance, is transformed into an image of utter dependence upon God. I want you to notice a word. We see it in the 11th verse, the 13th verse, and the 14th verse, and it's the word to stand. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand the wiles of the devil. In the 13th verse, take the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. And then the 14th verse, stand therefore. How do we do that? Well, let, let's look at this just a little closer. And by the way, where did Paul come up with this? I mean, obviously... Paul knew Roman soldiers, so he knew all about the, the shield and the sword and all that kind of stuff. But this imagery is not Roman. It actually goes back to the book of Isaiah. If you begin in the 14th verse, he talks about the belt of truth. I'm, I'm going to read three passages from the book of Isaiah. 
Isaiah 11, verse 5. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips and faithfulness the belt around his waist. And in verse 14, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Isaiah 59, 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. You know, yesterday was St. Patrick's Day. And one thing that we did here is we talked about St. Patrick's breastplate. In fact, for those of you in the sanctuary, just grab a hymnal if you see one close by and, and look at number one. It's not a hymn. It's a confession of faith. And it's what is often called St. Patrick's breastplate. And it's some powerful words. It begins, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and the one in three. The, the story of St. Patrick is fascinating. He was, he was born into a Christian family. His father was a deacon in the church. His, his grandfather had actually been a priest. And so Patrick was born in a Christian family. He knew the faith when he was, I believe it was 16 years old. He was captured by pirates. I mean, this is 5th century from Ireland. And they carried him to Ireland and made him a slave. And he, for six years, he was a slave in Ireland. He was mainly a shepherd. But he escaped, found a boat, ended up going to France. So he's, he's out of Ireland, out of captivity. He re Actually, when he was a shepherd, it said he rediscovered his faith. I guess if you're a slave, that's the time to have faith, and he, he found it. But later he became a priest, and then he was ordained a bishop. And then one night he had a vision, just like Paul had a vision. And the vision, the children of Ireland were asking him to come and help them. So he went back to Ireland as a missionary. And the rest is not just history. There's a whole lot of legend. We were talking about there, the man Patrick was a devout Christian who deserves to be called a saint. But there are a whole lot of myths around Patrick. Uh, the snakes. The kids really got hung up on the snakes yesterday, didn't they? <laughs> running the snakes out. Even the thing about the clover, about explaining the Trinity, uh, a lot of people said, ah, oh, that may have just been a myth or a legend, but, but, but I think we have to look at his legacy. Here was a devout Christian who was serving in a dangerous place, but he had this, what we call the breastplate of, of his breastplate, of his righteousness, of his faith, and those words, Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, all of those words, he was surrounded by Christ. And when he and his men traveled in a dangerous part of Ireland, they would repeat this. And they were always safe. He not only is talking about the, the breastplate but also, I want you to notice this thing about the shoes. Have, it's in verse 15. Having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Going back to Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, who publishes peace, who brings good tidings of good, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. 
I, I was doing a little research on this and I found an, a minister who was talking about this and I, I, I want to read what he said. He said, the shoes of the gospel of peace interest me. My son has autism so much that he doesn't speak. So most all the communication in our house is nonverbal. When my wife and I come down each morning, the first thing our son does is check our shoes. He has learned that the shoes we have will predict what kind of day we have planned. So if I have my good shoes, my dress shoes, he knows I'm going to work. But if we have casual shoes, then he knows we're going to have a more relaxed day. These are the shoes of peace. I, I want you to notice something, think about something. Every aspect of the whole armor of God is defensive except one. And it's the final one. You have the shield of faith. You have the breastplate of righteousness. You have the shoes of peace. You have all of this. But look at the 17th verse. The helmet of salvation. But the only thing that is not defensive is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The only offense we have is the word of God. And again in Isaiah, he made my mouth like a sharp sword and hid me in the shadow of God's own hand. I think this is a powerful way for Paul to bring this letter to a close because it's saying the most powerful weapon that we have is the Word of God. And it's the proclamation of the Word. And so many times it is the Word of God that is spoken. It is the Word or maybe a Word that is not spoken that speaks volumes. I want to share something with you that happened a long time ago. It was in the, I guess it was in the mid-90s. And it was back when I was calling football games with Harold Bowen. And I was also asked to be the chaplain of the football team, which I really enjoyed that because... We, we would go to the stadium and set up for the broadcast and then I would go to the locker room and, and I would get to deliver a little short, inspirational message to the team, you know, before they went out on the field. I was the chaplain and, and I would usually share a life lesson with them. I usually like to have a good football story to tell them you know, about perseverance and not giving up and giving 100% and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, this is an aside, but uh, somebody from South Davidson invited me to come down there one time and talk to their football team. So y'all know South Davidson. So I'm down there and I'm just like, you know, you guys just give 100%. There's no limit to what you can do. You need to dream great dreams and one of the boys looked at me and said, Mr., have you ever seen our football team? <laughs> so that didn't work very well. But le le let me tell you the, the one pregame that I will never forget. The week before, we had played at one of the county schools. And... Some of our, and, and for Lexington, the majority of the players were black. When we'd go to a county school, the majority of the players were white. 
and some of the players on the other team had used racial slurs. And, and that was bad enough. Now, I didn't know about any of this until a few days later, and the football coach told me he wanted to talk to me, and he told me what had happened. And he said, but let me tell you the worst thing. He said, I said something to one of the referees about what these kids were saying. And the next thing I knew, one player came off the field and was just in tears, a black player, and said, the referee just called me by the N word. The referee. And I said, you have got to be kidding and, and my first impulse was, you've got to call the state. You've got to register a complaint. You know, we can't have this. Uh, he said, hold on a minute. He said, if I registered a complaint with the state high school athletic association, he said, we'd never have a chance. He said, every referee in this conference would turn against us. Because they all know. And I said, well, what can we do? I wanted to fight. I wanted to respond. I was angry, just like those players. And he said, there's nothing we can do. That's why I'm turning to you. So boy, I agonized over what I was going to say to those players the next week. And then I thought about one of the greatest stories not only in sports, but also in American history. The story of Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. And a lot of you know that. By the way, I did not know that Branch Rickey, who was the general manager of the Dodgers, he is the one who hired Jackie Robinson, who became the first African American to play Major League Baseball. I did not know that he was named the most influential figure of the 20th century by ESPN. But let me, it, a lot of you know this story, but it's such a powerful one. And it, it all started when he was a child. Branch Rickey was born into a Christian family, a very strict Christian family. In fact, he was such a dedicated Christian that he put his own baseball career in jeopardy. He was signed by the Cincinnati Reds, but he told them, I'm not going to play on Sunday because my mother doesn't want me to play on Sunday. And he didn't. Even when he became an adult and he was the manager and the general manager and then the president of the Dodgers, he refused to go to games on Sundays. He wouldn't even go to the ballpark on Sundays. He was so conscientious. In 1904, he was the baseball coach for Ohio Wesleyan University. And they had a black player named Charles Thomas. Now this is 1904. And they were playing somewhere one day, and when they got to the hotel they refuse to let Charles Thomas in. They, they said, we can take all the other players, but he can't come. We can't give lodging to him. Well, Ricky wouldn't accept that. He told the hotel manager, he said, listen, um, you know, you have to let him in. He's part of our team, and if he's not going to come, none of us are going to come. Finally, the, manager, the hotel manager agreed to let him stay as an unregistered guest. When Branch Rickey had worked all of this out, he went up to the room and he saw this boy, Charles Thomas, young man, sitting on his bed weeping. That image never left his mind. And he said years later, it was that image, that memory that propelled him to do what he did. A lot of people said, well, Jackie Robinson was one of the best baseball players ever, which he was. He just wanted to win. Branch Rickey knew exactly what he was doing. Of course, they all want to win, but he wanted something even greater. 
And so in August of 1945, Jackie Robinson met with Branch Rickey at his office in New York City. The meeting lasted three hours. During that meeting, Branch Rickey threw every insult, every racial slur, every demeaning phrase that he could in his face. Finally, Jackie Robinson asked, are you looking for a Negro who's afraid to fight back? And Robert, I mean, and Ricky said, I'm looking for a Negro ball player that has enough guts not to fight back. And that was the deal. He would hire him, but Jackie Robinson was not allowed to retaliate. When they hurled racial slurs at him, he couldn't say a word. When they threatened his life, he couldn't respond. And if you've ever read about it or seen movies about it, I mean, it was rough. Everywhere he went, it, it, even his own teammates to begin with, uh, didn't want him to be there. But they went to Philadelphia and they had a manager by the name of Ben Chapman who was a good old boy from the South and the entire game, Ben Chapman stood on the steps of the dugout and hurled insults at Jackie Robinson, calling him every name in the book, telling him that he should go back to the cotton fields. And uh, Branch Rickey said later on it was Ben Chapman who united his team around Jackie Robinson. Because when they saw what that man was doing to their teammate, that was when Pee Wee Reese, you've all heard of him, they said he walked over to Jackie Robinson in front of everybody and put his arm around him. In other words, you're on our team now. Jackie Robinson became great because he didn't say a word. It was the power of truth and the gospel and of righteousness that made it happen. So that night, I told those hurt football players that story. And I said, Jackie Robinson will always be remembered, not just as one of the greatest baseball players who ever lived, but as one of the greatest and most courageous men who ever lived. Not because what he said, because what he did not say. I don't know that it made any difference, but I think they listened to me. And I think they understood. Frederick Beekner writes... If you want to know who you really are, as distinct from who you would like to think you are, keep an eye on where your feet take you. Peace is the goal. Our feet, not our words, will get us there. The author of Ephesians, Paul, doesn't commit to any one style of shoe as the most appropriate for spreading the gospel of peace. I suppose that wingtips or high heel pumps will do. Even crocs or flip-flops. But my experience is that spreading peace is hard work. My money would be on work boots as the best. Probably a pair with steel toes. And I would add or maybe baseball cleats to do the work of peace.